You guys can sit down. I don't, is my mic working today? Hello. Yeah, it's working. Cool. Hey, really quick, I know there was a gentleman that came here that was struggling with homosexuality last week, and I already took off. Um, I'm here, obviously, today, and I'll wait for you if you're here. You don't have to say where you're at. All right, I want to talk to you after. All right, cool. Thank Thanks for coming. And what's your name? Don. Okay, awesome. We're all going to pray for Don right now. Lord Jesus, we come before you, God. Thank you for bringing uh, Don back here today, God. You love him so much, Lord. You, um, you just love him so much, God. And just like any of us, Lord, that get caught up in our own uh, fleshly desires, um, you set us free because whoever the Son of God sets free is free indeed, Father God. And I've seen you do so many miracles just in this place with these people here in my personal life, God, and I'm excited to see what you're going to do with him, Lord. Thank you, God, for never judging us and always loving us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Awesome. I'm going to tell you, how's everyone doing? Good? It's good, to, it's good to see everyone again. I got a couple stories for you I want to tell you guys about before we get going. We went up, we went up to uh, Northern California this week. And remember I told you, I said, well, there's going to be a lot of time in between. And maybe God will do something. Well, God did something in between those, those dates. Crazy style. So we, uh, we took off from here on Friday morning and uh, pinned it all the way up to Salvation Army event, which was in Susan City, which is outside of Sacramento. And it was like a skateboard event. They, I mean, I don't know if you guys know about much about the, um, the um, Salvation Armies, but uh, they're, they're around. There's like thrift stores and stuff. But the owners of, in, the owners of McDonald's, when I guess when they died, the, 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 the mother put in the, the, the lady of the relationship, the mother or mom or whatever, she put, in the, she put in the contract that she would donate X amount of millions to the Salvation Army to bid, build centers that have like pools, rock climbing, teach classes of creativity, and then they have like a church attached to them. So there's actually 27 of these um, built around the United States, plus there's like the thrift stores and all those and just other churches. But this thing cost, I think, like 27 million to build. And there's 27 of them across the United States. Crazy. So we show up, and this, this place looks amazing. When I saw it, I was like, no wonder. I'm like, we definitely got to get our own building. Um, it was packed with young kids, big old skate contest in the front. And I'm watching these kids skate. All of a sudden, I look over, and I see this group of people, and they're all wearing the same outfits. They're in, like, sweatsuits with Velcro shoes. And I'm like, something looks interesting with these guys, right? So it turns out that <laughs> some of you guys have been to jail, no? Um, so... Turns out that one of the ladies is following the movement, one of the correctional officers, and she got a hall pass for a group of them to come out. And so we see them, we start talking to them, and they're all kind of like, you know, you know, you know how it is, kids trying to be hard and whatever. So we're, we're chopping it up, and, and I go, hey, man, I go, they just gave us uh, food in the back. Like, they have, like, pasta and cake and all kinds of stuff for, for, for the, the whosoever guys. And I said, I'll give you guys all of our food. Do you guys want to come eat with us? So they're like, what? They're like, we haven't had food like this in forever so we take them all back dude they're just eating everything in sight the pies the apple pies and the salads and the pasta and everything and it was so cool because our group i took shiny headband and then my wife and myself and who else was on there and then lisa their mom so i said hey you guys let's all split up to different tables so we all split up to different tables and it turns out that me and my friend gerardo were at the table with the guys that wanted to sell drugs and make money and do that and then Tyler was at another table with this kid that's pursuing art. So God placed us, and then he put the girls with the girls, but God placed us all at the right tables so we were able to minister and talk to these kids. So anyway, they don't, they don't know anything about the movement because they haven't seen the video. So we go in, and, uh, you know, I, I start talking, and, you know, everyone's talking, and, you know, everyone's getting loud. So we play the whosoever video, the three-minute doc, and then all of a sudden, after they've seen, like, what we're involved with, they're like, huh, what, huh? You know, ears are up trying to hear what I had to say. So then I tell my story, and I'm like, man, you know, this is like, we have the skateboard culture here, and the skateboard culture, they think Jesus is a joke. It's like, they don't even care less about, Jesus is a joke. And it, it, they're about 666 and pentagrams and stuff. Like, that's trendy now. But uh, so I go, man, if, when, a Christ, when a skateboarder gets saved, I'm in shock. I'm, I'm in shock when a skateboarder gets saved. So I said, there, there was like, probably like, I don't know, maybe like 40 or 50, you know, skaters, and then there was other people there, and the Juvie Hall kids, and I'm like, God, you know, doubting Thomas over here, I'm like, God, are you going to work here, man? You know, I don't know, man, these guys, you know, you know is it going to work? And I'm just giving, you know, God just gives you the boldness, and I start giving the gospel, and then I'm like, man, tell them about how punk rock Jesus was, and this and that, and, you know, 
Jesus was whipping people out of the temple. Like, what? What? I'm like, I'm like, hey, I'm like, if you want to be punk rock right now, come up here and give your life to God and don't care what anyone thinks. And 90% of the place came forward. It was like, boom. It was, I'm not a counter, okay? I'm not a counting guy like, hey, man, three people got to say, praise the Lord, brother. I'm like, I don't care. It's not my business, you know? I'm just a fisherman, you know? Like, God, God works all those details. So anyway, so the place gets saved, and we're like, oh, wow, that was amazing. Uh, then we just, we loved on them, and, and then we left, and we went to the next place, which was Teen Rescue, and we got to hang out with the boys and girls, and uh, the girls went with the girls, and they made, like, bracelets, and they made them, I, if you guys follow us on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, you'll see the post, the picture of the paintings. So they had all the girls paint a bunch of stuff, which is pretty heavy, like what was actually written on there. Uh, they did paintings, they did testimonials. Kayla from Shiny Head Band, the girl with the shiny head, she told her story about her having uh, melopecia. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's her nervous, her system attacks her hair, thinking it's a disease or something, so it, it makes it, it kills the cells and makes the hair fall out. So she doesn't have cancer, it's melopecia. So she's telling her story about self-image and how she, when she was eight years old and she lost her hair, how, what that was like and what God was speaking to her because I mean, can you imagine being in a situation like that at a young age and being a, a woman? And her hair is like her, like, her mom has, you know, they're a Cuban. She has like the curly, long, full head of hair, and she had like blonde hair before, you know? And it was like special. She was like the only uh, blonde in the family. And then, you know, what happens is she gets malopecia. So she tells her story. So it was perfect for those girls up there um, to, to hear that. And then from there, uh, we, you know, we did a Bible study, we prayed for them, we ate, we played games, and then the boys, we went over to the boys' section, and, you know, that's like the cabin where they're all farting on each other, you know, all the guys, all the, all the, all the teenage guys, you know, it's like, you're talking, well, all of a sudden you just smell, you're like, whoa, who, who just, you, the guy I'm talking to just farted in my face, are you kidding me right now, but that's the way the guys are, you know, eating hot dogs and beans and stuff, you know, so we hang out with them, we play soccer with them, and then we played a full football game with them, and I've never been so sore in my life. Last time I was that sore was when I went snowboarding for the first time in 1989. Dude, I cannot believe it. You know, playing soccer and football, I don't use those muscles. I skateboard, I'm on a board, you know? I don't use that stuff, so I was sore, but it was on. But anyway, at night, we, uh, we watched um, God's Not Dead with them, and then we kept, you know, we prayed with them. I had my friend tell his testimony, Gerardo, and uh, after they came up and started talking to us, and uh, one kid came up and he was, you know, talking how he struggles with, with um, porn, uh, porn, and, you know, I just told him, I said, dude, you just got to deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus. And I uh, just kind of gave him that message and told him what that meant, which I'm going to tell That's actually where we're at in, uh, in Mark tonight, so I'll break that down a little bit later. Um, and I just got to lay my hands on him, pray for him, and just said, hey, man, statistics say, you know, 68% of men in church consume pornography. So, and 50% of, of church, uh, relationships, marriages in church are broken up, divorced because of pornography. I said, so you're not the only one. You're not alone. Just like anyone that's struggling with homosexuality or drugs or alcohol or anything else that the body appetites want, um, that's, it's, it's all about denying yourself, and it's painful. And I'm going to get into the, the pain of, of getting, getting through that stuff because it's body appetites, body wants, you know? And, uh, but after we do it, <laughs> whatever that body wants, that's not, wasn't, uh, any, after we go after what the body wants, that's not really, that is not really right for the body, we're, we're, we're always, like, depressed after, uh, can't believe it. You know, you know that you guys know the story. We, we all deal with it. So told him that story, and then another kid there that was there, he was kind of, he had, um, what did he have, autism. And he was, like a, he was like a real smart kid, but he had autism. And he came up to me after, and he's like, hey, he's like, does God ever talk to you? I'm all, yeah, yeah, he talks to me sometimes. And he's like, oh, he's like, he's like do you ever feel God's presence? I say, yeah, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes over me once in a while. And he said, you know, I want to feel God's presence. Will you, will you pray for me? And I'm like, yeah, 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 I'll pray for you. So I, I prayed over him. And then he's like, do you speak in tongues? And I'm like, yeah. And he's like, I speak in tongues too. He's like, I, he's like when I was three years old, uh, I got baptized with the Holy Spirit in, when I was sitting in my mom and dad's car when, when I was three years old in a gas station. And I'm like, what? I'm like, what? He's like, yeah. He's like, and I just started speaking in tongues for 20 minutes. He's like, do you want to speak in tongues? And I'm like, he's like, do you want to pray in tongues? I'm all. Yeah, all right, whatever. So, so I'm like, because I'm like, what's up with this kid? Got baptized when he was three years old. I want to hear this dude's tongue right now. And, dude, he started cranking out tongues. I've never heard. This dude had a full vocabulary. Wow. This kid was speaking in tongues for like 15 minutes, never the same words, 
And it was like, it was like so intense. And after I was like, dude, lay your hands on me and pray for me right now. <laughs> so he laid his hands on me, and the, you know, all the all the people, you know, the, the instructors there or the, the you know the staff were probably looking over and like kids like praying over me and like and it was crazy. And then when they were playing worship, this kid was going nuts for it. Like, he, dude, God had his hand on this guy. I, I walked up to him after I was like, what do you mean you never feel God's presence, dude? You're like flowing with the spirit. You're like overflowing, I wish I was you. Like, you're crazy, kid. And then I walk in, and I'm talking to some other kid, and we're actually giving all the kids Bibles, and all of a sudden he comes up to me, and a kid's autism, they're on their own, they're on their own program, okay? You know what I mean? So he walks up to me, and he hits me, he's all, hey, he's all, hey, I just had a vision. I'm all, what? And he's all, he's like, I just had a vision. I'm all, I'm all, what was it? He's all, he's all, all the kids that are here in this house, we were all on a boat, and we crashed, and then the, and Jesus showed up, and his light showed up. And it was overseeing us. And I said, well, that's exactly what happened. You got all, every single one of you guys have crashed in your life, and that's why you're here. And God's light is here with you guys. He goes, I know. And he, he laughed and walked away. I'm all, what the heck? I'm all, this dude. I'm glad he prayed for me. <laughs> so, yeah, I do these stories, man. So, anyway, I can't wait to see that kid again. So, um, so anyway, so we, we, this was our third time to, to teen rescue, and it was, Man, it's just getting more amazing and more amazing. And, and um, we're going to start grabbing, uh, taking up a couple of you guys at a time. We're just going to, people that are serving with us, we want to just see where your guys' hearts at. You guys, you know, put the time in here working with them. We want to start taking you guys to this thing because it's such a special place, these, these kids, how much, how much love they, they have for us. And the last time I told you about the story of the guy that was playing the corn riffs, or not corn riffs, um, tool riffs, and he was uh, manifesting in the, in, the, in the boys' room. And he was going crazy, and the bouncers had to hold, or the security guards had to hold, not security, what do you call them, staff, had to hold him down, and he kept manifesting. And I came up, and I, I prayed with him, or I talked to him, and he said, hey, um, you know, I keep manifesting, I have anger, and this and that. And I said, well, you're playing those tool riffs on the guitar, and tool's like, dude, there's, like, I know, Pew Dean them know those guys. Those guys are, like, straight into, like, Satan, like, legitly, like, Satan worshipers. And I go, you're playing those riffs, dude. I go, number one, that's a doorway. You're opening yourself up because they, they're about Satan. He's like, they don't, they don't say they're about Satan. I said, well, why would they tell you, kid? You know, they're not telling you. And, and he kept playing these riffs. So I said, okay, stop playing those riffs. I go, what do you have here? He goes, I have this painting I drew. And I, he's like, I, and he starts shaking. The kid starts shaking as he's talking to me. And he's like, I'm, I feel terrified and scared right now. And I'm like, okay, dude's manifesting, right? So I go, let's go down to your room. So we go down to his room. I go, I'm going to clear out everything. And I start going through his stuff. And he shows me this painting of this, like, demon thing walking on a, walking on a um, sword. And it has an all-seeing eye on his stomach and an all-seeing eye in its uh, head. And then the, the sun has an all-seeing eye. And there's, like, stuff coming out of the sun. And I'm like, why do you draw this? Like, what does this mean? He's like, I don't know. It just came out of me. I just, I just drew it. I'm like, okay, we're getting rid of that, number one. And we start going through all of his stuff. And anything that looks sketchy, we just started getting, uh, grabbing, putting it together. And he's shaking the whole time while this is happening. I said, okay, dude, an ax, you know, they got all the witchcraft books and they took him out into the street and they lit him on fire. I said, where's the fire pit? I know you got one, this is a camp. So we went out to the fire pit and it was dark, dude. There was no lights out there. I'm like, oh, this dude jumps on my back, demon possessed. This is gonna <laughs> stink right now. So we go out there and we, we go to the pit. And I start ripping everything up. I'm trying to rip the book up. And I'm like, in the name of Jesus, you know, we rebuke you, Satan. We're giving this as a living sacrifice. We're gonna let this be a sweet smell and aroma to you. We're, we want to break all curses and everything that this kid has opened himself up to. And we're trying to light it. It's not lighting. I'm like, come on, Lord, light this thing up, dude. <laughs> so it lights up finally. And it's like having problems burning. So we're trying to throw stuff on it to, and fan it to get it going. And as it starts burning, the kid... Dude, the guy, it, look, it starts just smoking because it's not lighting on fire big time. It's just smoking with a little flame. And he puts his face in the smoke, and he's going, Arr. dude, the whole time. And I'm like, oh, get this thing going, Lord. Burn this thing. And, dude, he's just like Arr, growling at the smoke. And he's in, in the smoke. Any human would be like, you know, coughing and stuff. And he was just growling, and it just burnt up. And we took him upstairs anointed him with oil, prayed with him, and it turns out, okay, he was cool that night, and then it turns out we went back three months later, and they said, dude, he's doing great. He graduated from the program, and he left. He's in love with Jesus. Crazy. <laughs> so, so crazy things happened up there, and we baptized all the people there last time we were up there. Some girls like, will you baptize me? And I'm like, I don't know if we can. And they gave us permission, and we were like, all right, started dunking everyone there. <laughs> so that was that.
It's awesome, man. Good stuff happened up there. Then we went to Santa Clara um, Juvenile Hall Center. Um, on the way, we're driving. Okay, this is when the enemy comes in, right? So we're driving, and uh, all of a sudden, dude, a car gets a blowout. This tire comes flying up in front of my car. My, I drive right over it. So it goes underneath my car and shoots out the back, hits Lisa's Suburban. It hits the manifold and basically just takes out the car. The manifold, it, it, the exhaust on the manifold breaks off, so the car's going three miles an hour and it's packed with traffic. We're trying to get there, like our map quest says, we're gonna get there right on time at six. And uh, they pull over and we're sitting on the highway going, okay, what's going on? And they're like, we, we have to get off the highway. So I'm like, all right, we're gonna just pin it to the Juvie Hall because the door opened for us to get into the Juvie Hall. So we're flying over there. My gas tank's about to run out of gas. Um, I basically get there, I have to get gas, and then I get there right on time. And thank God they actually thought we were showing up at 6.30 because we showed up 30 minutes late. So they already moved the event 30 minutes back. So we, we got there at 6.29, right on time. God's never late, right? Right on time. And then Lisa ended up pulling off, and she ended up at this place, that, uh, like a, a service center, and it turns out that God used them to get off and meet up with a mechanic and end up praying for this mechanic. So I don't know if it's the enemy or what happened, but long story short, we got there on time and God took them on a different mission to pay, pray, pray for some mechanic. So then we go into the Juvie Hall and we show up and I've never been in, into a Juvie Hall and all these like girls come in and they got tattoos on their face and the whole thing and all these gangster kids come in and I'm like, oh brother, here we go. Like this is gonna be a tough one. I've, I've never been in a Juvie Hall. So we start telling our stories and I'm like, these guys ain't getting it, dude. These guys are ADD. These guys ain't getting it. And we're just telling them our stories. And next you do, next you know, we do the altar call. And the whole place gives their life to the Lord. They're like, I'm like, I don't know why I'm doubting so much, you know, this this trip. But God's just working. It was it was a room of like 17. Um, because you have to, if it's of the gospel, then you have to um you have to say, I'll go. You know, it's it's man, it's not mandatory. So as we were leaving, the girl from, the girl goes, the girl that's running it goes, hey, she goes, I can get you in a maximum, um, maximum um, prison where people are doing 180 to 280 years, double, triple lifetimes. And she says, you guys, she goes, all the, she goes, all the religious people that come in here don't ever connect with these guys. I've never seen this done. She goes, if you guys come back, she goes, we'll get you into the main juvenile hall. If you guys bring a band, you, we'll, we'll let you guys do the th your thing to the whole, popu the whole um, population in there. So we're planning to go back take a band and give the gospel in the main population and then go to maximum. <laughs> God worked again. Boom. Then we go down to, oh, and then we met with this one 13-year-old girl that was having a suicide. She sits down. They actually let us meet with them after if they want to talk to us. So a 13-year-old came up to us after and she's like, hey, I want to talk to you guys. And we're sitting there and she's just like, oh, I forgot. You could tell like she didn't want to say it. And I'm like, look, I talk to kids all the time. Trust me, I've heard it all. And she's like, well, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm suicidal. Or she goes, I, 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 I've, you know, been suicidal. And I said, I go, do you hear voices in your head? And she says, yes. And I said, do they tell you that you're ugly and you're stupid and you're no good, this and that? She goes, exactly. Because it's the same thing. It's demons. And demons are talking to them, and they want you to not like your life, and they want you to kill yourself. And I, she said, I tried committing suicide three times, and I wasn't successful, and now I'm here. And I said, well, you know, I just told her, God loves you. I read her. Uh, Psalms 139. If you guys have ever been suicidal or you think God doesn't love you, read Psalms 139. And as we started reading it to her, you just seen peace just come over her. And she just starts smiling. And, and Danny, the guy we were with, is like, he's like, when I read that to you, peace came over you, huh? She's like, yeah, it did. And God, just the Holy Spirit came over. We laid our hands on her and prayed for her. And then she went back to her cell. And hopefully we'll, we'll get to see her next time. Then we, um, then we went to Teen Challenge in... Uh, we went to Teen Challenge. Are you some Teen Challenge people here? We went to Teen Challenge in Sacramento, and it was cool, man. It was an old house. It's been around for 40 years, that house, Teen Challenge, for 40 years. It's one of the older ones. The original one was, was out of New York. But uh, we showed up, and all these guys were there. We, 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 we you know, gave, gave a message of deny self, pick up your cross, and follow Jesus. And then we went to an afterglow, and a bunch of people, you know, because they're not all Christians there. It's like half-half, because people are coming and going. But... You know, there was a good half of uh, the guys there accepted the Lord, and uh, we just loved them. We went to an afterglow, anointed them with oil, prayed for them, and then, uh, then we came back. So it was, uh, it was an amazing four days, and I'm looking forward to keep doing these little one-off tours and just uh, shaking the place up. Today, we're going to, oh, yeah, the photos. So did you guys see them all? 
That's Teen Challenge. Yes. That's cool. Okay, cool. Um, all right. Well, I'm going to finish um, Luke 8 with you guys tonight. Luke chapter 8. It's going to be the last two stories of there. And tonight is going to be, at the end, it's going to end with deny yourself, which I'm, I'm stoked for. Because that's something that you have to remember every single day of your life. Um, sometimes you, you stop denying yourself and you get yourself into a sticky situation. And you find yourself in a place where you're like not connected with the Holy Spirit and you're just making a mess of your life. So it's, we have to constantly deny yourself daily. Um, Mark 8. Let me pray really quick. Lord Jesus, ah, God, it was a crazy week, Lord, and you did amazing things, God. And uh, I feel like I'm like a, I had a spiritual high, God, and now I'm like down. But I need to come up in the name of Jesus, God. Baptize me with the fire and the power of the Holy Spirit, God. Let me burn right now. God, give me the words that you want to say, Lord. There's people in here that are going through different things in life because life's crazy. But we're, uh, we're just pilgrims here, God, and we're, we're not of this world, Lord. But we're coming to you, Father God. So I pray now that you give me the words to say for those ones, Lord. And the ones that don't feel love, I pray that you fill them with love. The ones that are being lied by the enemy, God, I rebuke Satan in Jesus' name. I pray that if anyone's come in here with any kind of spiritual darkness, God, through Ouija boards or tarot cards or drugs or anything like that, God. Maybe that they've been having that darkness in their life, God. I pray that you remove that in the name of Jesus. This is the house of God. Set them free right now in the name of Jesus, God. Take that off so that they could hear what the Spirit has to say. And the people that have hard hearts, melt their hearts into flesh right now in the name of Jesus, God. We want thy will to be done. We know that you've come to set the captives free, Father God. And I know that a lot of people that come to shine either have been set free or in the process of being set free, Father God. So we thank you that this place is a hospital and this place is not judgmental and this place is a place of love and this is a place of grace and a place of mercy. Give us your heart, God. We want your heart because our hearts get us off track all the time. God, give us your mind. Give us your heart, Lord. Help us to love each other. People that are here, help them to love one another, Father God. Help the people that are here that are walking with God. Let them um, hear what the Spirit has to say. If there's someone they need to talk to, let them go over and pray for them, God. We're a family. We are walking this together. Yes. No one is better than anyone. I don't care if you've been a Christian 20 years or two seconds, Father God. We are all equal in your eyes, and you love us all equally, Father God. And those ones that have come out of crazy lifetime, crazy backgrounds, there's more grace for those, God, more grace. So much grace, God. Thank you for that grace and that mercy, God. And we know that when you touch our lives, Father God, that we'll never be the same. We'll never be the same and we'll become holy as you are holy, Father God. And those things that we used to do will pass away and all things will become new. You will renew our mind, Father God. So we don't have to live as a spiritual yo-yo, going back and forth, these mountaintop experiences with God and then in the dumps, God, we can be level. And little bumps here and there, because that's the way life is, little bumps. But it's part of the adventure, God. Thank you, Father God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God, makes me cry already, man. All right. Romans. No, not Romans. Uh, Mark. Did someone say Romans? Throw me off, dude. You know I got ADD, dude. Don't play that, all right? Oh, real man cry, okay. <laughs> who, who is that? <laughs> okay, what's up, man? How you doing? <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, so, Mark 8, chapter 27. Ah, uh, what? Chapter 8, verse 27. I'm sorry. What? No, Mark. Did I say Luke? What? Luke 8, please, turn with me. I'm sorry. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Is this Teen Challenge? <laughs> okay. Mark 8, verse 27. Not Luke. Mark 8, verse 27. Okay, that's it. Zip. Zipit.com. Okay. Uh, Jesus and his disciples left Galilee and went up to the village near Caesarea Philippi. Now, Jesus just left the blind man. Remember, he, he couldn't see in the village. He took him out by the hand, and he healed him. And he's doing all these miracles. He fed the 5,000, the 4,000. 
He's doing these miracles, and the Pharisees have hard hearts. They don't believe this is still the Messiah. And nor do his disciples. They, they're, they're not getting it still. Because remember, he's like, well, who, how, he's like, we need to feed the 5,000 disciples. And they're like, how are we going to do it? And remember, the, the first problem is when, when, we, when we're hanging out with God, we don't say we or I, it's he. He's the one that does everything in our life. And they still weren't getting it. He fed the 4,000 before, and he, now he fed the 5,000, and they're just, they're, they're just hard-headed. They're not getting it. So now they're going up towards Caesarea Philippi. Some of you guys went to Israel with us last time. Is there anyone here that went to Israel with us? A couple? No one? No one? Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> went to Caesarea Philippi. That's where Herod the Great um, named it, Caesarea Philippi, because there's another Caesarea down by the ocean so to, to, to keep them um, separated. Caesarea Philippi is an interesting place. It's a place made, um, by, it, right? It's a place where the Greeks actually used to worship um, their gods. They had a temple to um, Pen, which is their god, which Pen is the guy with the um, hoofs, feet, human body, and um, like horns in his head, like half man, half uh, a goat, which is interesting because have any of you guys seen that stuff online right now where they're building a, a statue of a satanic character in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he has, a, he has a goat body. It's basically, if you Google Satanism, it's the goat head with a man body and the goat body, and he's sitting, he's sitting on a chair that has a pentagram behind him, upside down, and he's doing a hand signal like this, and he has two little children that are like eight years old looking up, like, like worshiping him, like, like laughing. And they're putting this inside the college in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Google it when you get home. It's crazy. I'll post it up on, on my Facebook tonight when I get out of here. Um, if I don't forget, someone remind me, hit me up on Instagram. But yeah, it's seriously, it's crazy. It, and it's done, and they're putting it up. So I sent it to Sonny Head and them, and Sonny replied, when are we going to go there and smash it? <laughs> so we've we got to make some plans to smash it. I was like thinking, I'm like, man, I could go to jail for that. Just break it and end up in jail, and I don't know, whatever. <laughs> Be worth a try, right? So... Anyway, so this place, Caesarea Philippi, is where they actually worship the god Pen, which was the god of fertility. And uh, he actually looks like that. He has a goat body, a human body, and he has a little, um, you know, those little things they play, those little, um, pipe, they look like little organs or flute. It's like a flute. There's like long ones and they go to smaller. Huh? Hand flute. Hand flute. And he plays the hand flute. And the myth is that he used to chase women and actually have sex with them. And what's crazy is they would actually sacrifice to this god up there. So Jesus is actually going, think about this. When I read this today, I was like, dude, Jesus was not just posted up in the temple. He was going to one of the gnarliest pagan cities with major occult, occult stuff happening. You know, we think about where would Jesus be today? Dude, he'd be at the satanic festivals, you know. You know, at, you know he'd be at the satanic um, conventions. He'd be at porn conventions with the, with the prostitutes and the strippers and the porn stars. He'd be in the teaching the temple. He'd basically be like the whosoever movement. Just everywhere. You know, just that's what's up. And so this is Jesus. He's taking the disciples to this place that's super gnarly pagan rituals, the God of Pan, and it's just a gnarly place to be. But it's actually a beautiful place to be. When you go there now, it's super amazing. Um, going on, it says, as they were walking along, he asked them, who do people say I am? So he's asking the disciples, who do people say I am? This is a place of many gods where he's walking with them. So it seems right that he actually asked the disciples, hey, well, there's all these gods here. Everyone's worshiping these people. Like, who do you fools think I am? <laughs> you know, you guys don't believe that I can heal people. You guys just see me raise the dead. You guys just see me do all these miracles. But like, who do you feel? Who do you guys think I am? So I want to ask you guys here tonight, who do you think Jesus is? Is Jesus that that picture of that guy you saw in Sunday school with the lamb around his neck looking all weak? Is Jesus, that shirt, Jesus is my homeboy? Is he your homeboy? Because that don't cut it if he's your homeboy. Because what you want is Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. Lord means you follow him and you do everything he says because he knows the best for you. He's the Lord of our life. Or is Jesus, you know, just, uh, just who is he? You know, is he just, uh, just a made-up character that someone made up and nothing's real, you know? Who is he? So he asked the disciples... Who do, you, who do you say I am? And, and Peter replied, oh, wait, whoa, did I just skip? Hold on. <laughs> Jesus sent them away. Wait, hold on, hold on. Sorry, I'm sorry, dude. I'm out of it today. Okay, here it goes on to say. 
As they were walking along, he asked them, who do people say I am? Right. Verse 28. Well, they replied, some say you're John the Baptist and some say you're Elijah. And others say you're, the, you're one of the prophets. Now, do you remember when, when uh, Herod, Herod uh, cut off John the Baptist's head and then Jesus was going around and healing people and Herod's like, oh, it must be John the Baptist raised from the dead. So some, you know, Herod was saying he was, he was uh, John the Baptist and then, you know, um, uh, 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 Muhammad, you know, the guy from Muhammad said that Jesus was, um, he was the, um, he was one of the prophets, you know, they don't believe that he's the son of God, the, the, um, what do you call them, the Muslims, they believe that he's just one of the prophets, he doesn't have the deity of Christ, so he's saying, some think you're the, uh, the Elijah the prophet, some think you're John the Baptist, some just think you're other prophets, then Jesus asked them, but who do you say I am, and Jesus, Jesus, uh, and Peter replied, he says, you're the Messiah, you're the son of God, which is interesting because finally God had an encounter with Jesus and op or had an encounter with Peter and he opened his eyes because Peter's been walking with him and the disciples have been walking with him up to chapter 8 right now, not believing that he's the son of God. And finally, he admits he's the son of God. And this is who Jesus says he is. If you, if you don't know, here's some verses. Jesus said in John 6, 15, he says, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread... He will live forever. And we know that the word of God, the Bible, it's, it feeds our spirit. It's the word of God and it feeds our spirit. And it's funny because sometimes, you know, people, if we're walking with God, you know, some people don't read their Bible for three or four days and next you know they have the anxiety and they're like, oh, what's going on? And then all of a sudden they eat, they eat and all of a sudden they feel that peace again. It's like, would you, would you not eat, would you not eat food? you know, for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. If you stopped eating breakfast, lunch, or dinner, you would know you would start to feel hungry and pains and get angry and different things. Well, in the same way, you guys, feeding off the Word of God is that important. We have to not only eat every day. You guys are strict on your diet. You eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? And then, obviously, stuff in between. But um, we should be that way about the Word of God with, with Jesus Christ, reading the Bible. We should devotion in the morning or a chapter or whatever you can, something on the way to the in your car, on the way to work, on the way home. But you need to feed, and it's good to feed a couple times a day if you want to be spiritually strong. So Jesus says, I am the bread of life. John chapter 8, 2, uh, 8, 23, it says, And he said to them, You are from beneath, and I am from above. You are of this world, and I am not from this world. He says, I am from heaven. I'm eternal. John 8, 12, it says, Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So if you're walking in darkness right now, whatever it is in your life, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And if you have me, there'll be no darkness. I will give you the light of life. He has come to give life. John 8, 5, 8, Jesus said to them, most assuredly, I say to you, Abraham, uh, before Abraham was, I am. He's saying, I was at the beginning. I'm eternal. I've always have been. John 10, 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out of fine pastures. He will, if, he's the gate to eternal life and to peace and to grace. He's saying, John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives, gives his life for the sheep. What does that mean? He says that he's the shepherd. He oversees the sheep. We are his sheep. And if the wolf comes to attack Satan, let's just say the, the roaring lion, to whom he, he's looking to whom he can devour, when he comes to come, come to devour us, he's the shepherd. He won't run. He'll be there for us through those, those times. The hireling, the, the people that doesn't care for their shepherd, he will leave for the, the sheep to get eaten alive. And I was actually talking to the Teen Challenge people about the, the, um, the roaring lion, is that you're, if you people that are here right now, some of you guys are, are not completely in fellowship and have people around you that you can walk this life with, this Christian life, and you're struggling. You've got to be surrounded with like-minded people because the enemy, Satan, is like a roaring lion. He wants to come in, and you've seen on Discovery Channel when the lions come in to smoke the gazelles in Africa, what do they do? They team up on the weakest one, the straggler in the very back, the one that's by itself. They isolate it, and then they destroy it and rip it apart. And that's the same way Satan and his demons are. They want to get you alone, get you out of fellowship, reading the Word of God, praying. And then what they want to do is they want to get you alone when you're by yourself in your room. Oh, I don't want to go to church. I've sinned. I can't do this. i got to stay by myself. Then they come in and mess with your mind, and the next thing you know, you're back sinning harder than ever. You want to commit suicide or whatever, whatever those struggles are that Satan wants to isolate you, and then he'll rip you apart. So 
Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Jesus is the shepherd. He's going to watch out for you. But you got to stay close to him. That's, that's the key. John 10, 36 says, do you say... Do you say of him who the Father sanctified and sent into the world, you are blaspheming because I am the Son of God. Jesus said, I am the Son of God. So no matter what people think, he is the Son of God. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection of, and the life. He who believes in me, through, uh, though he may die, he shall live. Jesus is saying, if you believe in him, he's the resurrection of life. He died on the cross, and he was raised from the dead. So if you believe in him, when you die, or we don't, we don't die, our eyes close, and we instantly open our eyes in eternity. We live forever. So he's saying, I am the resurrection and the life. John, 9, John 14, 6 says, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. John 15, 1 says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. And, I, you know, I was reading about the, the vine the other day. Is, uh, Jesus is the vine, and through, if we abide in vi- Christ, if we are in Jesus Christ, he produced branches and fruit comes out of it. And as we are one with Christ, as we accept him as our Lord, as our Savior, and we read the word of God, fruit comes out of our light. We start changing those things that we used to do, we stop doing. We start feeling love, we start having self-control, we start having patience, we start having kindness. <laughs> like, did you guys have that when you were in the world? I didn't. I didn't have patience. I didn't have kindness. I, didn't, I definitely didn't have self-control. You know, um, you know, meekness and all these different things. As we abide in Christ, our life transforms. But it says that if we don't abide in Christ, and our branch, we decide to we we, we uh, die to the branch or to the vine. Then it says that the Father is the the vine the vine dresser, and He comes and He cuts those branches off and throws them into the lake of fire. That's pretty heavy when you, when you think about it. So we got to abide in Christ. So that's who Jesus is. And Peter said, yeah, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Because right now, he's, he hasn't gone to the cross. He, he wasn't time for him to die. And he still had to teach the disciples. He was doing a bunch of miracles. But now he has to really start pouring into these guys and discipling them. So when he leaves, that they'll be equipped. So he's like, don't tell anyone yet that I'm... The son of God, my, basically my time's not yet. So going on, verse 31 says, Then Jesus began to tell them that the son of man must suffer many terrible things and be rejected by the elders and the leading priests and the teachers of religious law. He would be killed, but three days later he would rise from the dead. Now, he's basically telling these guys, guys, I got to, I'm going to go to the cross. First, I'm going to get rejected by all the religious people. They're going to reject me. They're going to take me. They're going to crucify me. I'm, you know the story when he gets crucified. He got whipped 39 times. He got beat. He got spit on. Then he had to carry that cross all the way to, the, to, to, the, uh, to Golgotha. And then he would die and he would raise again. So he's, he's basically telling all these guys what's going on. Like there's going to be bad stuff going on, but it's part of God's plan. And then I'm going to, raise from the, I'm going to be raised from the dead. Like, that's the good thing. That's what needs to happen. Because if he doesn't raise from the dead, then we don't have forgiveness of sins we're forgiven of our sins when he raised from the dead so he's trying to tell them like to pump them up and as he was talking about the talking about this opening with the disciples peter took him aside and began to reprimand him for saying such things so now here's peter peter knucklehead guy he's just like hey, come, jesus come on man. i gotta talk to you you know don't don't basically don't don't say these things you know D- don't don't say these things but the thing with peter is that he's seeing from He's seen from a spirit, he's not seen from the spiritual eyes that this is part of God's plan, number one. He's seen from his fleshly eyes because Peter's thinking, hey man, Jesus is here. We're going to set the kingdom. We're going to overthrow Herod and it's going to be Jesus, Peter, sons of thunder, all the knuckleheads on the throne hanging out and it's going to be the most dysfunctional posse with Jesus the Messiah being the only one that's functional, um, overseeing and just taking the land back. So Peter's like, dude, no, 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 God. Jesus, you're the Messiah, but that's not the plan. You can't die. And how many times do people say something to us and we only hear the first negative part? I'm the king of that. <laughs> right? You in the you in the front? He's like, I'm gonna die. And I'm like, oh, you're gonna die? No, no. That ain't gonna happen. We're gonna protect him, you know? But then when you hear the end of the story, it's like, no, no, no. 
These things have to happen, but there's good that's going to come out of it. These things are taken care of. But Peter reacts like, like normal humans, and that's why I can relate to Peter. Uh, verse 33, Jesus turned around and looked at him and the disciples and, and reprimanded Peter. Get away from me, Satan, he said. You are seeing things merely from a human point of view, not from God's. So again, like I said, he's, he's seen things from a physical, not a spiritual. And we got to look at what, what God's doing in our lives, guys, because we don't understand everything that happens. But we got to know that God, all things work together good for those who love him. And sometimes, like Peter, God's doing something, and you're like, God, you know, that's not the game plan. <laughs> I don't want that, you know? Like when I used to pray, oh, God, hook me up with the girl when I first got saved. God's like, Ryan, you would end up in a butt-naked wrestling match. You would mess everything up for that girl, mess everything up for you. You don't even know how to treat a girl. Since when do you know how to treat a girl? He's like, yeah, right, Ryan. But I'm like, come on, God, why are you doing this to me, man? This is messed up. I gave my life to Jesus. You owe me, man. You owe me. I gave up everything for you, God. Hook me up. He's like, oh, yeah, you gave up everything. You gave up your heroin addiction, your crack addiction, your drunk, you know, drinking, all your, you gave up that miserable life. Oh, poor you, Ryan. <laughs> I hooked you up, Ryan. <laughs> and that's, that's the way it is. It's, the, it's that spiritual life, you know. And I thank God that I didn't get married until six years later because I really figured out who I was in Christ by the time I got married. So thank you, Jesus, for hooking me up six years later. Uh, verse 34. Then, <laughs> verse 34, then calling the crowds to join his disciples, he said, if any of you want to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. Okay, now I underlined a few things in here. I underlined, if you want to be my follower. So, if you want to be my follower, Jesus is going to point out a couple, couple things. You must, I underlined, you must. If you want to be my follower, if you want to follow Jesus, since he said he is the way, the truth, and life, and no one, comes to him, no one comes to the Father God but by him. So he said there's no other way, no other religions. I don't care if you're some hippie, worship the trees and all that. Nothing. Only Jesus Christ. Mary doesn't get you to Jesus. Jesus Christ gets you to Father God. Yeah. He says you must... Turn from your selfish ways, I underline selfish ways. Selfish ways are, we have to become selflessness. We have to have selflessness, selfishness. We can't be selfish. Selfish ways is our body appetites. We have to, we must turn from our body appetites. Take up your cross and follow me. Take up your cross, and I told you the cross is a beautiful place because there's forgiveness of sins. Jesus died on the cross, thank you Jesus for that but it's pain and suffering. He got spit on, he got beat, he, laid, he got crucified, he laid up there on the cross and he hung. And that cross, there's pain and suffering and it's brutal. In Romans 1, uh, 8, 13, it says, if you live after the flesh, he shall die, but if you live after the spirit and do mortify the deeds of the flesh, he shall live. Mortify means to self-inflict pain. That means we have to kill, we have to murder our flesh. We have to put it to death, those body appetites, of those things that you're dealing with, that homosexuality, put it to death. Say, God, you say, you, you say, Jesus, that you, you came to set the captives free. You say that all things become new and all, all things pass away and all things become new. Say, those are promises, God. Do it. Challenge him. And he's going to be like, oh, you want to be touched? All right. I'm going to touch you. I'm going to start transforming you. And it's one step at a time. I'm not saying those desires and those things won't be there, but you know what? I still think about porn sometimes because I reap what I sow, Right? We op whatever we've opened ourselves up to, all of a sudden you get those thoughts and you got to put your thoughts into um, subjection to Christ. You start thinking, whoa, I'm not going there. Boom, end it right there. In the name of Jesus, take me another direction. Because if I start thinking, I could go on through gigs of hard drives and stuff I watch, just thinking, thinking, and thinking. Next thing you know, I'm lost in porn land. And that's the same way with drugs. Drugs or whatever, I see someone smoke and crack on TV, I start jonesing, like, whoa, I remember what that feels like. And I can start thinking more and more, and I might even just act on it. You know what I mean? You gotta stop that thought. You gotta deny yourself. Pick, so you gotta stop the, the, the mind, because the enemy is like a roaring lion coming into the mind. It's about mind games. How many times you guys know about the mind games the enemy plays? That's his number one tool, and he'll get you in your sleepy too, right? When you start feeling tired, he'll move right in quick. So we got to deny self, 
pick up our cross. It's going to be painful. And he said, follow me. Well, he didn't, when he said, follow me, he just said, follow me. And I'm like, well, follow you where? <laughs> he doesn't say. He says, follow me. I love it. And follow me, I thought about it. I said, yeah, you know what, God? You never told me where we were going. <laughs> he never told me. But I'll tell you this. Dude, it's the sickest adventure I've ever been on in my life. And if there's any old people listening, it's the raddest adventure I've ever been on in my whole entire life. It's never ending. It's just, dude, God opens up things in the streets that people talk to people, just wherever. It's the raddest life I've ever had. And he just didn't say anything. He just said, follow me. That's simple enough. Like, okay, I'm going to follow you. So verse 35, it says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. I underline, if you try, you will lose it, I underline. Try. If you try, it means you, it's not going to happen. If you're trying, you're trying to do something. So he's saying, you could try, but it's not going to happen. You're going to lose it, period. If you don't follow him, you're going to lose your life. Bottom line, that's what he's saying right here. So you can underline that too. Going on. But if you give up your life, if you give, I forgot to underline that one, if you give, so it's an option because it's free will. God gave us free will. We either accept Jesus Christ or we deny him. You know, you can say, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't have it all figured out yet. I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, you've decided. No, because you're not saying yes. <laughs> no gray area. Yes, no, period. So he's saying, if you give up your life for my sake... And for the sake of the good news, which is the gospel, you will save it. So if you decide to give it up, it's your choice, you will save it. That's a, that's a fact. You will be saved. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul? So if you got everything you've ever wanted to in your whole entire life, if you gain everything and you lose your soul... What does it work? Does it matter? What's your soul worth right now? That's my question. If you're, I talk about hell a lot, but Jesus talked about hell 260 times in the New Testament, more than anything. So don't hate me. Jesus said it. So I'm just, I'm just a representative ambassador. What right now is taking you to hell? What are you doing? Is your porn addiction going to take you to hell? Porn. Porn, take you to hell. Is your soul for eternity to be burning in hell for a cheap thrill that you hate doing anyway? Or how about come downs from drugs? I've done every drug and they all have a come down. Some worse than others. But you hate it every time you come down and you're never happy. Only when you're super high out of your mind, your problems are, are over. But that only lasts a certain amount of time. Because it's like the shiny object, you know? It's like Satan, he, he you know how he, ca you know, I was thinking about how Satan catches us. You know, I, I was thinking about, I go, I'm a fisherman. I fish for men. You know, I'm a disciple. I fish for men. And I go, dude, Satan's a fisherman too. And when, when Satan goes fishing for actually fish, he uses those lures, those shiny objects. You know, you know, the fish just eat like, I don't know what they eat. They eat like, um, what do you call them, mosquitoes and stuff, flies or whatever, you know? But then Satan's like, like us, you know, we, we, we just live our lives, we're like these, these fish, and then Satan comes in and throws this lure, and it's like sparkly little things hanging off it with like rainbow glitter, and the fish is like, what? <laughs> Boom, scoops it up, and then, bam, he's like gutting it, and they're either flaying and eating it. And that's what Satan does. He throws these little shiny objects, and these shiny objects that I'm talking about, is that your porn addiction? See, Satan's like, oh, dude, come on, porn's cool, man. Feels good, do it. Oh, get, get, get wasted with the boys. You know, go out and get drunk. They need to do these stupid things and, you know, chaos, life of chaos and in and out of jail and this and that. Shiny object. Oh, but it's fun. Have you ever seen the Coors Light women? You know, the, you know, the, the, the commercials, you know, it's all the... That's not even what people look like that drink beer. They're like, you know? <laughs> they ain't looking all hot like that. That ain't happening. Show the real people that drink beer. They're like, purple noses. They're all guts. Liver's going out. Dialysis. You know what I mean? Put those people, come party with the Coors Light team. <laughs> what is that shiny object? What is that? What are, you, what are you going to hell for? Dude, forget that, man. Come to Jesus tonight. Going on. Verse 37. 
If, <clears throat> is anything worth, or, and then it goes on to say, is anything worth more than your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? No, the answer is no. Your soul, it's eternity, it's forever. You can't even think, you start thinking about forever and ever and ever, it's just forever. We live forever with God and all of our loved ones. Going on, verse 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, this, these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory with his Father, with his holy angels. He's basically saying, if you're ashamed of the message that he's given to you today, if you're ashamed of Jesus, he's going to be ashamed of you. If you're ashamed of him here on earth, if you can't get it together here, when we all die, because we die one day, and the, 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 in, in Revelation 20, it says that the, the book of life will be written out. And if your name is not written in the book of life, when you accept Christ, your name is written in the book of life, eternal life. If your name is not written in that, you'll be judged and you'll be thrown into heaven or into hell. And basically, he's saying, if you don't accept him here, if you're ashamed of be, being with Christ here, when judgment day comes, he's going to be like, you didn't know me. I don't know you. Yeah. I gave you a chance. Ryan actually spoke to you about me on Thursday night at Shine right now. If you want to receive Christ and you're here, give me a thumbs up. I want to pray for you tonight. Walk out. Right on, I see you. Walk out of here a different person. Anyone else? Cool. Right on. See you guys back there. Anyone else? Cool. I see you two back there. Right on. I'm going to wait. I know there's some more here. I'm going to pray actually for those ones. Right on, I see you too. Hold on, let me pray. Right on. Lord Jesus, I pray right now for those ones that are, that are there contemplating what's going on. It's, you know, they might even have the enemy in their ear right now saying this guy is a fool. He's a liar. This is not true. Jesus doesn't exist. All that stuff, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. Father God, pour, pour your presence right now in this place, God, and soften those hearts of those ones that came in that, that need to be changed, those ones that be renewed, those ones that um, need to have life, abundant life, torrents of living water, God, in them, Father God. Open their hearts now, Father God, and break any spiritual chains that are holding those ones back right now in the name of Jesus. Is there anyone else? Maybe that was you I was praying for. Throw your thumb up, but I want to pray for you. Cool, right on. Anyone else? Okay, I want to pray for you guys. We're going to all just say it together um, as a family, because we're family. Say, let's just repeat this and mean it with all your heart, you guys and girls. Say, Jesus, Jesus. Please, forgive me, please forgive me, Lord, for all my sins. All my sins. I, want I want to accept you as my Lord and my Savior. My Lord, my Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, you that accept the Lord, I want you guys to come up here, and I want to give you guys a free Bible and show you guys where to read. It takes five minutes. Just stand up and come up here. And the rest of you guys stand up. Please. Just come up here right now. You guys that put your thumb, we're going to give you guys a free Bible. Just cruise out. Come on. Come on. I see you guys pointing at each other. Just get up here. Come on. You're like, you go first. Come on. Oh, yeah. Just cruise over here. And if you didn't stick your thumb up and you gave your life to the God and you said that prayer, cruise up and we're going to give you a Bible too. Just cruise over. Right on. Well, all the one, I'm going to announce one more thing. We're going to wait for you guys. Right on. Just cruise right on. Okay, you're going to hang out there? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Are you guys co coming up for the Bible? Yeah, cruise over here. Just all the way back there. Right on, dude. Give me five. Five, five, five. Yeah, boy. All right, so look, this is the deal. I want to, I know uh, it's 8.30. If you have kids, you have to get them at 9. People will leave you if you, if you want, but I, I felt led to go into more of a worship session because of the message about deny self. I believe that there's stuff in our lives that we need to get rid of, and we, I want to open this up for a worship session and, and just to get real with God. You know, you guys could come up or however you guys want to do You could pray there. When we stick our hands up in the air, that's a way of us putting our white flags in the sky, saying, God, we surrender to you. If you want to get on your knees and worship, we want to go into a hardcore worship session right now. 
and just make peace with God and sing with all of our hearts to him and let him set us free that already have Christ in us, that these things that are in our life that are dragging us down, those body appetites, those things that are dragging us down, just pray with your heart to God to set you free. And I promise the Holy Spirit will come upon you guys now and start working in your guys' life. So we're going to worship right now.